Hi, so today I'm going to be giving you a quick introduction to Shankiran analysis. The goal is that by the end of this video, you should be able to grasp the main concepts of Shankiran analysis and be able to do some simple analyses of your own. So Shankiran analysis can be quite daunting at first, and some of the literature can seem very dense. But with this video, I want to show you that it isn't all that complicated. It can be very useful and even fun. So let's get started by looking at what Shankiran analysis actually is. It gets its name from its creator, the Austrian music theorist Heinrich Schenker. He published a number of works towards the beginning of the 20th century laying out the notions of this method, which has since been hugely influential. Shankiran analysis is probably most well known for the idea of the Ursatz. It's what most people think about when they think of Shankiran analysis. Ursatz is a German term that translates to fundamental structure. Indeed, the goal of a Schenkirin analysis is to understand the structure of a piece of music at various levels. So there are three structural levels, or layers, that we're going to want to understand. One of them being the Ursatz. This is also called the background layer. We'll get back to this in a second. The easiest layer to see is what we call the surface layer, or the foreground. This is basically everything that's happening in the music, in all its detail. Then we try to simplify this layer, taking away notes that are only really there for decoration, and leaving the most important ones that give the music its meaning. This is called the middle ground. We move from the foreground to the middle ground by a process called reduction, because we're reducing things to a simpler, more basic level. And this is probably the most important skill to master for Shankirin analysis. We can then reduce the middle ground again to reach an even simpler layer, which is the background. The background is going to be so simple that we can represent a whole orchestral movement with just two lines of notes. Shankirin analysis can be summarized as this process of reduction from the actual music at the surface level down to its most basic fundamental structure. If you understand this, then you're well on your way to performing an analysis yourself. Let's see how this process of reduction works. There are a few things you'll need to know if you want to do this. So the most important are to have a basic understanding of harmonic analysis, scale degrees and Roman numerals. A basic understanding of figured bass is also needed. If you're not quite at this level yet, there is a video on this channel giving a crash course introduction to them. Of course, it goes without saying that you'll need to be able to read music. If you understand these basic principles, then you have everything you need to get started in Shankiran analysis. So we're going to follow a simple four-step method to go through a piece of music in all its detail to finding the underlying Ursatz. Note that this method and the example we're going to use has been taken straight from Tom Pankhurst's book, Schenker Guide which also has a website with lots of great exercises for learning and practicing Shankiran analysis. The link to that can be found in the description. We're going to use a very short, very simple example. Let's have a listen to it. We start by doing a simple harmonic analysis of the piece. First, we find the key, which in this case is G major. Next, we add the Roman numerals. We start off on the tonic chord of G major. Then move to the D major 7, which is, of course, the dominant. And then resolve on the tonic G major. Simple enough so far. For the second step, we're going to start by notating the music in a simplified way. We'll first get rid of any bar lines. Then represent each note with a stemless quarter note head. And finally, remove any same notes that occur consecutively. This is moving towards what is called analytic notation. We're essentially evacuating any kind of rhythmic notation. The purpose of this stage will be to identify elaborations on each harmony. These are foreground elaborations or prolongations. What foreground elaborations can we find here? First, we see a linear progression. This is a stepwise motion in one direction between two harmony notes, called a zug in German. 
Here it's a third progression, going down from the B to the D, passing by the C. It's marked like this. Next, we have a skip down from D to G. We're still in the same tonic harmony, so we identify this as an arpeggiation, which we'll indicate with a slur. Over the dominant harmony, we first have a complete neighbor note, or neben note in German. This is a note that moves away from the harmony note and then moves back. Here, the harmony note is the A, moving down to the neighbor note G, then back up to the A. We note it with a slur and an N for neighbor. Finally, with the B, we have another neighbor note. But this time, it is incomplete, as it does not return back to the A. We won't connect the final B and G, as they are not part of the same harmony. In step two, we analyzed chord by chord. Next, we're going to link up these foreground elaborations into larger spans and try to identify larger harmonic patterns such as 1-5-1. One, one. Note that here, and to a certain extent in all the steps, there's never one correct answer as such. There are often multiple ways of analyzing a same passage. However, some solutions will be more elegant than others, and the more elegant a solution is, the more meaningful it will be. As we go deeper into the layers of analysis, it will be more and more important to try to find melodically fluent solutions, such as stepwise connections. To try and understand this, we'll first give a middle ground analysis that, while not incorrect, is very unsatisfactory. Then we'll compare this to another analysis. First of all, we can use downward stems in the bass to mark the roots of principal supporting harmonies, so going from the G, the D, and finally the G. This is simple enough, and more or less indisputable. We use slurs to mark the main bass arpeggiations, 1-5 and 5-1. Beneath the Roman numerals, we can also mark harmonic patterns, like the 1-5-1 here. Again, up to here, things remain fairly simple, and they can't really be interpreted any other way. It's our top voice that's going to be more complicated. Let's use stems and beams to show large scale movement and propose one possible interpretation. Here, we're saying that foreground elaborations are basically lining together as decoration of a neighbor note progression starting on the tonic G, moving to a neighbor note A, then back to the tonic. The upper voice in the bass would also be following this movement. Now, let's consider this analysis. Here, all the progressions are joined into a single span of a third progression, starting on the D and going down to the G, passing by the A. This is a much more satisfactory solution. Let's discuss why. First of all, solution B explains the first three notes much better. In the first case, they seem to be nothing more than somewhat of an anacrusis. Next, we can think in terms of compound melody, which is when a single melodic line suggests other voices. Here, the G could be considered as a lower voice beneath the initial B. Next, this solution seems to better show the prominence of this B, which in the original piece is a long note and higher than the G, giving it more prominence. Finally, a stepwise movement will always be a very elegant solution. Step three is usually repeated several times, going deeper and deeper until we reach step four, where we'll try and identify the ursatz, or background, or fundamental structure. Schenker gives a standard model that, in varying forms, can be found on the deepest level of the music. This consists of a descending upper voice, or urligne, and a bass progression, or bassbrechung. The ursatz of our example can be shown as follows. We start with the bassbrechung, marked with downward stems and beams, 
connecting the root notes of the chords. This is simple enough. The urlignes shall be marked like this. Note the figures above mark the scale degrees. The first note of the urlignes, here the B, is called the Kopfton, or primary tone, or even head tone. In practice, this can either be 8, 5, or 3. Then the urlignes always descends down diatonically to 1. There is a possible exception to this called an interruption, but we won't go over that here. A quick note, we'll also note here the compound melody identified in step 3 with the slur between the B and the G. So, to summarise, we've gone from this initial piece of music to this harmonic analysis, to this foreground analysis, to this middle ground analysis, and finally reached this background layer. In practice, a few bars like this wouldn't be treated to a background analysis like that. This is something that would normally span over the whole piece. There's obviously much more to cover in Schenkirin analysis, and lots of key terms have been quickly glossed over here. But hopefully this has given you a basic understanding of its principles and how it works. You can see that it can be interesting and useful to really understand how a piece of music works. Not only can it be useful in analytical terms, but it can also help develop your compositional practice. Of course, this is a form of analysis that only makes sense when applied to certain types of music, and it has been criticised for only concentrating on the score. Be that as it may, it's an important tool to grasp for any student of music. Once again, this example was taken from Tom Pankhurst's book and website on Schenkerian analysis. This is a great reference, along with Alan Fort and Stephen Gilbert's Introduction to Schenkerian Analysis. For an in-depth guide to Schenkerian Analysis, consult one of these books, or one of the many others that are available. Or, check out the in-depth guide on this channel. See you soon.